Hello! In this lecture, we are going to be looking at the elements and principles of composition. These are the tools that you will use to formally analyze an artwork. Now, these tools can be used for any genre of art, from painting, sculpture, literature, music, film, and so on. Your textbook introduces some of these concepts in the introduction and in the Get Started um, section that you should have already read. However, this presentation is going to give you a more in-depth view of these different elements and principles of composition. These are the tools that you'll use during class when we look at specific works of art. First, let's start with the elements of composition. There are five main elements, line, form, color, mass, and texture. Line is the basic building block of the visual arts. It has three main physical characteristics. The first type is the linear form, in which length dominates over width. As you can see on this slide, where the yellow arrow is, this black outline that we have, we have a very long line where the length is dominant over the width. You can also see here on the back with the green arrows. This line is an example of linear and the longer lines in the background. The next is line as edge or line as color edge. This is where on a plane where one color ends and another begins. For example, right here, you can see the blue-gray color ends and the white begins. This creates a type of line. And then finally, we have line by implication. What this is, is where we don't have a single linear line, but we have a line that is implied throughout an artwork. For example, in Starry Night, if you look in the sky, there seems to be a swirl here, and it continues on. Also here. But if you look at these, these are not a singular straight linear line. It's a made up of bunches of tiny little brush strokes, and through its implication, creates the line. You can also see it in this photograph. Here, the line is created through the river. This is used to control the viewer's vision, how we look at a work. Typically, when we examine a work, we tend to read it from left to right, such as we do in Starry Night. When we look at Starry Night, we tend to start here and follow the swirls, or we follow the line of the horizon. However, in this photograph, how the artist composed it with the river on the right side your eye should start here and then follows the river through the work. The artist is intentionally directing how your eye should go. When we talk about the composition of an artwork, we are talking about how the different elements are put together. The next one that we are going to look at is form. Form is simply the shape of an object within the composition. Form constitutes the space defined by the line. In two-dimensional art, such as in the objects here, you cannot separate form from line. If I had asked you to draw a square without using a line, this would be an impossible task. Next is color. There are many ways to talk about color. How we are going to focus on color is how artists use it. The first thing we're going to look at is what's called hue. Hue denotes the measurable wavelength of a specific color. You notice in a basic color spectrum there are six hues. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and violet. Your primary hues are red, blue, and yellow. Why? These colors are not made from a combination of any other colors. After the primary colors, we have the secondary colors, green, purple, and orange. These are made from equal parts of the primary colors. Orange is half yellow, half red. Blue, purple is half blue, half red. Green, half blue, half yellow. We also have what's called the tertiary hues. 
these are hues that are more of one color than the other. For example, yellow-orange. There's more yellow in this than there is of red within the work, making it yellow-orange. Then we also have what are called complementary colors. Complementary colors are colors that are directly across from each other on a color wheel. These are colors that the human eye tends to find pleasing as they go together. Red and green, Christmas. When you look at these, think of some of your favorite sports teams. A lot of times, their colors are going to be complementary colors. When we mix equal parts of complementary colors together, so if we put equal parts of red and equal parts of green together, this would result in gray. Next, we are going to look at what's called value. Value is the relationship of blacks to whites and grays. What you see on the slide is what we call a value scale. Now, when we look at values, when we add white to a hue, we call it creating tint. When we add black to a hue, this creates shade. Look at here on the side. You can see if you look at the red, as we add more white to it, it's going to get lighter and lighter and lighter, eventually becoming a pink color, and then finally pure white. As we add more shade to the red, it's going to get darker, darker, and darker, and then eventually become pure black. Brilliance of a color describes not only the surface gloss, but characteristics that are synonymous with value. Next is intensity. Intensity or saturation. This is the degree of purity of a hue. Again, the degree of purity of a hue. Adding colors across the wheels, again, complementary colors, when we add these together, as I told you, we get gray. But if you look on the slide here, where we start with the red and the green, as we go towards the middle, you're going to have equal parts red and green. This creates gray. However, when we look at this gray color, it's not just a flat gray. It is much livelier, if you will. You can see much more depth to it because of how it was created. Finally, the term palette as we use it in art, this is just describing the overall use of color used by an artist. The next element that we're going to explore is mass. Mass is defined as the physical volume and density of an object. For three-dimensional works, this is easy. If we wanted to look at the mass of a sculpture, we could physically weigh it. We could measure it. We could know exactly its size and its weight. However, this gets a little trickier when we're talking about two-dimensional art. For example, look at the painting here. This is by Peter Paul Rubens. It's the disembarkment of Marie de Medici at the port of Marseille on November 3, 1600. It was painted in 1626 and it is in oil on canvas. When you look at this painting, if I asked you what was the lightest object in the painting, you would probably reference the figure near the top that seems to be floating. If we look at this object, it looks to be some sort of winged figure. It's lighter in color. The clothing it has on seems free-flowing and almost frothy. And it's placement at the top of the canvas. We tend to believe that lighter things are placed near the top. Now if I asked you which objects were the heaviest or which people in the painting seemed to be the heaviest, you would probably refer to those who were at the bottom. Again, they're at the bottom. Usually we tend to believe that heavier objects are, to are towards the bottom. And if we look at these individuals, they seem larger than any other individuals in the work. The tones, the paint that is used, they seem to be heavier. We can see the flesh of them. It gives them substance, unlike the image at the top that seems to be floating on the air. So this is how we talk about mass in two-dimensional art. This is all implied. If we were to go and measure or weigh the differences between the top figures and the bottoms, there would be none. This is all just paint on a canvas. Yet the artist, through different tools and techniques, has implied the differences in mass. 
You can also see it in this painting. This is The Lady of Shalott by John William Waterhouse, 1888. It is also an oil on canvas. When you look at this painting, pay particular attention, pay particular attention to the clothing. The clothing that the lady is wearing seems much lighter. It's white in color, and we can see it's draping and floating within the water. Now compare that to the quilt that she is sitting on. Darker, heavier colors. It seems to just be draped and hanging straight down along the boat. And then once it gets in the water, it doesn't seem maybe to float as much as her dress does, but seems to just hang within the water itself. Now the boat, we can see that this is a boat of solid construction. The colors are again are dark and heavy, implying the mass. Yet, look at the lady herself. She appears light, again because of the color of the dress, but look at her hair. It even appears to be blowing within the wind, giving this idea of lightness. Again, all of this mass is implied. This is a painting. It is an oil on canvas. Yet how we perceive the mass is what the artist's intentions were. The next element that we're going to explore is what's called texture. Texture is a work's apparent roughness or smoothness. This may range from glossy to what's called impasto, which this is what you see in this work. Impasto is a painting technique wherein an artist applies pigment very thickly to a work with a palette knife. You can see here, if you look at the petals on the flowers, you can see how thickly the paint was applied. This was applied not with a paint brush, but with a palette knife. This creates a actual physical texture. If you went up and ran your hands along this canvas, you would feel the lumps and the bumps of the paint. However, texture may also be implied. This is a painting, the Mona Lisa, that we talked a little bit about in class this week. This painting, if you went up and ran your hand along it, would be very smooth. Again, don't do this, you'll get arrested quickly. But if you look at the work itself, we can see implied texture in many different areas. Look at the sleeves on her dress. It seems as if she almost has them bunched up. We know how that feels when we do it to our own sleeves. Yet how this was created by da Vinci is through lighting and shading of the work. The same goes for her hair and in the background that we can see different textures in the landscape behind her. Again, this is all implied texture. Next, we're going to look at the principles of composition. These are other tools that you can use to formally analyze an artwork. They consist of repetition, balance, unity, and focal areas. Repetition is broken into three main parts. The first is what we call rhythm. Rhythm is the recurrence of elements within a composition. Usually when we think of things such as rhythm, harmony, variation, we tend to think about musical compositions. However, that's not always the case. As we can see in the painting here in Pablo Picasso's work, Girl Before Mirror, there is repetition throughout the work. Repetition of the lines, the shapes, and even the colors of the painting. Regular repetition refers to elements that have the same size or importance. So if we look at the smaller triangles in the background, we can see that these are repeated. Now, they're not all the same size or even the same colors. However, they have the same importance within the work. The same can be said for the lines along her back. They are about the, all the same width, but they are different lengths, yet they have the same importance in the work. Again, this is called regular rhythm. Now we have what's called irregular rhythm. This is where we have differing sizes and or different importance. So within the work, we can look at the different ovals within it. We see different ovals within her hip, her face, but probably the most important one is the oval within the mirror. This one, not only are they all different sizes, but they are of different importance. The oval that creates the mirror is clearly the most important within the work. 
We're also going to see it in work such as this. When we look throughout this, we see the repetition of these swirling lines. However, they're different colors, they're different sizes, and they're different important. This is all referring to irregular rhythm. The next principle that we're going to look at is harmony. Harmony is the logical repetition of components that appear to join up naturally and comfortably. Again, we're most familiar talking about harmony when we talk about music. When things are harmonious, they usually sound pleasing to the human ear. Well, this is also true of visual elements. When things are in harmony, they look pleasing. We can look at this photograph. Here, the leaves and the stems of the plant are all in harmony. They're not equal sizes and they're not equal distance apart. However, they appear to join up naturally. Now, when something is not in harmony, this is what's called dissonance. This is when elements appear very illogically. This work, it's done very on purpose. Usually dissonance creates a feeling of chaos and of disorder within a work. The third part of repetition is what's called variation. Variation refers to the relationship of repeated items to each other. Again, we're back to the Picasso work. Here we have a variation of different triangles, the diamonds, the ovals, and the colors within the work. Most of these are repeated throughout the entire artwork. The next principle that we're going to look at is what's called balance. The balance is the achievement of equilibrium within an artwork. When we are looking at an artwork to see if it is balanced or not, what we do is we cut the artwork on a vertical axis, meaning a north-south line. Then what we do is we see if the sides are balanced. So if we look at the painting here, this is Georgia O'Keeffe's Cow Skull, Red, White, and Blue, 1931, Oil on Canvas. If we cut this on a vertical axis, we're going to see it goes right along with the crease that is in within the, scows, the cow's skull here. When we look at the artwork, if we were to fold it in half along this vertical axis, it would still be pretty balanced. This is what's called symmetry, meaning the work has balance. It does not mean the sides have to be a mirror image of each other. Now, when a work is not symmetrical, it's what's called asymmetrical. You can see in this work by Pablo Picasso. It's called A Couple of Dancers, 1915, and it is an oil on canvas. Again, if we cut the work along a vertical axis and we folded it in half, this side would appear much heavier than this. In fact, if it had weight, this side, the right side, would tend to tip over. That is what we call asymmetrical, that we do not have this balance within the work. The next principle that we're going to look at is unity. Unity is simply asking, is the total statement of the work unified? Meaning, does the entire work tend to go together? Now, there is a classical definition to decide if something has, if a work has unity or not. This is what is called closed composition. In a work with closed composition, all the lines in the work direct the viewer's eye into the work itself. So if we're looking at the photograph here, all of the lines draw us right here. This is called closed composition. By classical standards, this is what was considered to give a work unity. Works that had open composition were deemed to be not unified. Open composition is where the eye can wander the canvas, that it can maybe start in the middle and then eventually goes completely off the canvas. This again is called open composition and by classical standard was considered not unified. This is a standard that has kind of gone away, if you will. Um, usually when we decide if a work is unified or not, then we are looking at the totality of the work and not just the open or closed composition. The next principle that we'll explore are what are called focal areas. Focal areas are areas of a work that seem to be of the greatest visual appeal or importance. The eye is drawn to look at these. 
you may have one or many focal areas within an artwork. There are different ways to achieve this through color, line, and even encirclement. The painting that we see here is Leonardo da Vinci's famous The Last Supper, 1495-1498, and it is Tempera on Gresso. Within this artwork, there are many different focal areas. Our eye is typically first drawn to the center figure, the Christ figure, and it's drawn there for many reasons. First, we have this right here. This is actually an element that is painted into the work. This is a fresco. It was painted on the wall. And so we have this very almost open, bright space that draws our eye in. Second, all the other people at the table seem to be in somehow pointing or looking at this figure. Whether it's the group on the left looking, the group on the far right pointing to the figure. And then even the lines in the architecture, the perspective that is used, draws our line to the center of the work. However, this is not the only focal area of the work. If we look at the other people that are pictured here, they are broken up into smaller groups of three. Each of these groups of three are doing something within each group. Whether the group on the far right all seem to be talking about something yet gesturing to the Christ figure. The group to their immediate left is all looking and almost seems to be talking to the figure. And then we have the two groups on the left side of the painting. Again, the group at the far left all seems to be gazing towards the center figure. And then the group between Christ and this far left group also seem to be holding a conversation within themselves. So while we have the main focal area of the central figure, we also have different smaller focal areas within the work. These again, this is where the artist is telling and directing the viewers where they should look within the work. Now, not all works have as many focal areas of this. Sometimes there's just one obvious focal area, such as in this work. Here we can clearly see the red square is the focal point. Your eye directly goes to that. It is the center of attention. And in this one, the artist has created that through the use of color. The rest of the work is black and white. And then you have this smaller red box that becomes the main focal area. There are also other factors that play a role when we are analyzing art. For example, perspective. Perspective indicates spatial relationships. There are three main types of perspective. Your book talks about two of these, but actually never mentions the third. First, we have linear perspective, atmospheric perspective, and then shifting perspective. What linear perspective does is it's two lines coming together at a horizon. Think of railroad tracks as we would draw them on a board. You can see within this picture, this is a photograph by Ansel Adams, it's the guard tower at Manzanar, you can see the linear perspective. Look at the street and how it tends to disappear towards the horizon. This gives us the idea that things that are closer to us, that are on the front and the foreground of the work, and are larger, are closer, why things that seem to recede into the distance are farther away. Okay? He's also, and so Adams is also playing around with perspective in this. He is actually taking this photograph from in a guard tower. This is Manzanar, which was an internment camp of Asian Americans during World War II. And as when Adams was invited to go into the camp, he was told that he could not photograph the guards, the guard towers, or any of the guns. So with this photograph, He's actually letting the viewer know of the guard towers without ever showing them. You can see from looking around, there's no tall trees, no other buildings. So you know he had to be from some elevated point of view when he took this photograph. Hence, he was in the guard tower. The next type of perspective is atmospheric perspective. This indicates a distance through the use of light and atmosphere. Again, Objects that are in the foreground are considered closer, and objects that are in the background are considered further away. 
This painting, Garakotz, Theodore Garakotz, The Raft of the Medusa, 1819, this is an oil on canvas. We can see the individuals on this raft are much closer to us. However, if you look all the way in the background, look at the horizon line to the right, follow that, and then you'll see this tiny little almost triangular looking shape. That is actually an approaching ship. Now, how far away is that ship from the raft? It's supposed to be very, very far away. Most of us probably wouldn't have even noticed it if it wasn't pointed out to us. This is the use of atmospheric perspective. The object that is very, very little is supposed to be further away from us. Again, this is a two-dimensional work. It is a flat surface, so in reality, the painting and the painting, the ship and the men are just as close to us because it's a flat piece of canvas. However, because of this use of perspective is how we get the dimensionality of the work. And then the third type of perspective is what's called shifting perspective. This divides the picture into two basic units, the foreground and the background. And then we have this openness in the middle ground. This became very popular in many Asian artworks. This is a water and brush work. Um, it's by Chu Zhan. It's Buddhist monastery by stream and mountains, circa about 960 um, to 985 CE. This is ink on silk, and it's actually in the Cleveland Museum of Art. Now what you see in this, if you begin at the bottom of the work, we're looking at the foreground. Here the objects seem to be close to us. But as we move up the work, up the piece of silk, the artist has invited us to take a journey. And you can see about midway up, we lose a lot of the detail. Yet when we continue up into the background, the background is the equal size as the foreground. The objects are the same size. Now, this is telling us they are the same importance. Unlike atmospheric perspective, which is trying to show us the ship is very far away, shifting perspective is taking us on that journey through the work itself, saying that the objects in the foreground and the background, while they may be a distance apart, they're still just as important to each other. The next factor we're going to talk about is what's called chiaroscuro. This is Italian for light and shade. This is what is used to suggest 3D forms via light and shadow without the use of outline. This is a trick photographers often use to highlight and shadow. Think about when you're creating block letters and how you give them a three-dimensional look to them is when you create that shading. Here there is an attached clip. Please watch this short YouTube video to fully understand the idea of chiaroscuro. All right. Some other factors that we'll look at are dynamics. Dynamics within a work mean the movement and stability based on line and figures. Vertical dynamics, up and down, north, south, usually give things a sense of dignity and grandeur. Think about portraits. All of your school photographs, those were on a vertical composition. Now, horizontal composition, going from west to east, this usually gives a sense of stability and maybe um, even placility. That's why landscapes tend to be in the horizontal, to give this sense of openness and grandeur to the work. Also, when we talk about dynamics, Think of two triangles. If we drew two triangles beside each other, one with the large flat sign on the ground, the other with the point on the ground. If I asked you which one of these two was more stable, most of you would probably say it's the triangle with the base on the ground. However, both of these are two-dimensional objects. One is just as stable as the other. But based on the dynamics of the work is the perceived stability that we get from them. Dynamics also very important within music. When works become faster, louder, we consider them more dynamic. This is usually done very intentionally by the artist.
The next factor is what's called trompe l'oeil, or trick of the eye. This is what's known as an optical illusion. It's where the artist is intentionally making the viewer think the work is something that it's not. In this, it's trying to convince the viewer that instead of just looking at the side of the building, that the building has actually caved in, and inside it's not just an open area, but that we see it as actually Doric columns. Another example of this are these chalk drawings, sidewalk drawings that are very popular. This is Trump Leol. This is an optical illusion. It's a trick of the eye. It looks like our figure here, she's jumping from that plank and she's trying to land onto where that manhole cover is. If she doesn't land there, it looks like she will fall to her death. Yet, what do we know what will really happen if she doesn't land on that exact spot? Nothing. It's sidewalk. She'll be fine. This is a trick of the eye. Next, we have what's called juxtaposition. These are how objects in a work are placed according to each other. So in the painting we have here, The Son of Man, 1964 by Rene Marguerite, um, we have, this is an oil on canvas also, what makes this painting so interesting is the juxtaposition. We have what would appear to be a normal businessman. However, instead of seeing his facial features, there's an apple in the middle of his face. There are other images of this where there's like a bird in front of the face. This is what makes this work so intriguing is the juxtaposition. Why we could analyze it and look at it, its color palette and that, the real important factor in this work is the apple. All right, well, what I have here, again, I've put up Garrico's The Raft of the Medusa. What I'd like you to do on your own is look at this work and see if you can use these elements and principles of composition to talk about the work. We will revisit this painting later in the semester. Thank you.